Hello, welcome to the next lecture from Web Services. Um, today, we'll talk about uh, SOAP again. So uh, just to recap, last time uh, we talked about WSGL, which was the technical language for describing web service interfaces. Uh, and uh, the lecture before, we talked about SOAP, which is the format XML language for actually sending messages among W3C style uh, web services. And the way it worked was that there was a sender who basically created some data to be sent to a web service, or, well, server. And um, the client could use SOAP libraries to actually envelop the exchange data in a SOAP message. And then according to the message transport binding, that SOAP message was sent over the network, either via HTTP or we talked about SMTP or Java messaging services and so on, uh, to the receiver. And the receiver receives the message, uh, takes a look at the SOAP part, the envelope, and if everything is okay, then uh, the exchange data is deserialized and passed to the server uh, code. Uh, <clears throat> if something goes wrong, a SOAP fault was, uh, was returned. And uh, the SOAP message looked something like uh, this. So it was an XML document with the SOAP envelope root. Uh, now the important part here was the namespace uh, of that SOAP um, element because that determined whether we are talking about SOAP version 1.1, as in this case, or SOAP version 1.2. Uh, now the SOAP message, has a, the envelope as a root, and then it has uh, an optional header with header blocks. And uh, we will talk about those in today's lecture quite a lot. And then uh, the body with the actual data uh, sent uh, from one application to, to another. And uh, we talked about SOAP in the context of sending a message from a client to a server, and then back uh, from the server to the client as a response. We um, tried that out in the tutorials um, on the calculator web service. And um, um, basically that was it. Um, we talked about sending yeah, the message uh, one way from the client to the server. That was one SOAP message exchange. And then from the server to the client was another SOAP message exchange. And if we wanted to relate those two messages, we needed those to be part of one operation described by WSDL and adhering to some message exchange pattern. Now, uh, today we are going to complicate things a little bit because we are going to introduce SOAP intermediaries. So in this case, the SOAP message can travel along a path of SOAP nodes where each node is a software that implements SOAP. And um, the path from the sender to the receiver with the intermediaries in the middle will be called a SOAP message path. So now the sender will again send the SOAP message and the receiver will be called an ultimate SOAP receiver. Uh, and that will be the final destination of that message. And in between, there will be intermediaries, which are nodes that can basically do something to the message that is being passed along the SOAP message path. Um, and the goal is, of course, to, um, um, to, to relay the data from the sender to the receiver. But on the path, something can go wrong. And uh, now let's take a look at uh, how actually the, the SOAP message relaying or, or, or processing works. So we are going to talk about the SOAP processing model here. And basically, the model defines how a SOAP node in either role should behave when uh, receiving uh, a SOAP message. So first of all, when receiving a SOAP message, um, the node needs to validate that message. So this involves uh, validation of XML, that's syntactic validation, then validation of the SOAP elements, whether there is the correct envelope and the correct body, and uh, whether the correct SOAP version is used. Um, if the message does not pass the validation, a fault is returned right away. When it does pass the validation, then uh, the SOAP message can be processed. And here, um, we distinguish the header blocks and the body. Uh, 
The header blocks can be processed by any SOAP intermediary and by the ultimate SOAP receiver. So up to now, when we had a sender and a receiver, the receiver was this ultimate SOAP receiver, and we didn't have any intermediaries, so uh, the receiver processed the header blocks. Now, the header blocks may be uh, processed by any of those SOAP intermediaries, while the body is intended for the ultimate SOAP receiver. So the intermediaries basically ignore the body, and um, it is intended mm, for the ultimate SOAP receiver, and it typically contains the application uh, data that is being sent from the sender to the receiver. Now, when an intermediary receives a message, uh, it can um, go um, in one of basically two or three ways. Either the intermediary senses some, some problem with the message and generates a fault and sends it back, or the message is OK, and it is forwarded along the SOAP message path. And uh, it may also happen that the uh, reception of such a message causes the intermediary to actually generate and send more messages uh, to some other places uh, as a result of receiving that original message. And uh, to configure or uh, hint at uh, how the SOAP message should be uh, processed, um, and again, we are talking about intermediaries, which means we are talking about header blocks. Those header blocks uh, will have three new attributes. Some of those we have seen already, but today we are going to explain those. So uh, the three new attributes for each header block will be role, uh, the must understand attribute, and the relay attribute. We'll start with the role attribute. When a SOAP message is received, by an intermediary or basically any, uh, any SOAP node. And the SOAP node assumes one or more roles uh, in that uh, message processing. Now, the role is identified by a URI, as you can see in the example uh, on the bottom uh, of the slide. Um, so that's a URI identifying a role. And um, that's actually an attribute uh, on the SOAP header block. And uh, this means that uh, the SOAP message and particularly uh, the, the SOAP header block targets a specific role. And when a SOAP node receives a message, it assumes some roles. And uh, well, when those assumed roles match those roles targeted by the block header, uh, the header block, uh, then the node needs to process uh, that particular header block. Uh, one side note, uh, this is SOAP 1.2. If we would, uh, to, uh, we would be to use um, the SOAP 1.1 version, uh, we would have the actor uh, attribute there. Now, as I already mentioned, the role attribute on the header block uh, is a URI. And uh, SOAP defines three standard ones, but also there can be application-specific roles. Um, because the processing of the individual header blocks is always application specific, uh, there can be application specific uh, roles which are not understood by SOAP itself. But there are the three standard roles defined in, uh, in SOAP. The first one is uh, the none role. Um, the rule here is that basically no SOAP node must assume this role. Um, which might seem weird. Why would we have such a role when no SOAP node can assume it? But uh, that's basically a header block intended for the ultimate receiver. Uh, and uh, um, the, the rule doesn't say that the intermediaries uh, cannot look at the header blocks that are not targeted at them. Uh, so they can have a look but they cannot process those header blocks, which means they have to keep them in the message and pass them along. So they shouldn't touch them, but they can still take a look at what is in that header block. So that's the none role. Then there is the ultimate receiver role, which is the default when no role is uh, actually specified uh, on that header block. And this means that uh, no intermediary should process that header block and it is again intended for the ultimate receiver. And the ultimate receiver must then process this header block. With the none role, 
even the ultimate receiver didn't have to process the uh, the header block and uh, didn't have to understand that header block. But with this one, uh, this means really that the ultimate receiver needs to process that uh, header block. And the, the last standard row from SOAP is the next row. And um, basically the next row means that uh, every everyone receiving the message with the header block targeting the next row needs to process that header block. So every SOAP uh, intermediary and the receiver, so basically everyone except for the sender, needs to assume the next row and uh, therefore process any header blocks targeted um, for the next row. Now, uh, when a SOAP node is targeted by the header block, that means um, that uh, its assumed role URI is equal to the URI found on the header block in the role attribute. Uh, basically what the SOAP node does is that um, it may decide to uh, process uh, the targeted header blocks. Uh, and this is application specific. So it means that uh, the SOAP library basically says, okay, here we have some header block that we need to process. And please, the application uh, tells the application, please process that header block. So that's not a part of SOAP. It just says that this, uh, this header block may be processed. Uh, and SOAP doesn't say, uh, doesn't say how. SOAP itself also doesn't say how uh, a SOAP node should determine which roles it will assume when it receives a message that is also application specific. So this can be determined uh, on a per message basis, or it can be also determined per instance basis. So you spin up the software and it already knows the roles it will assume, or it will determine the roles to assume somehow uh, during runtime that's not specified by SOAP. Now, uh, that was the role attribute. Now we move on to the must understand attribute. And we have already seen this one uh, when we first talked about um, SOAP. So this is a Boolean attribute. And it says whether or not that particular header block needs to be processed by the targeted uh, SOAP node or not. So it's also sometimes called a mandatory header block. And uh, we can see it in the example. So here we have a header block called max time, uh, and it has the must understand attribute set to true, which means that uh, and there is no role set. So the default is the ultimate receiver. And this means that the ultimate receiver must understand this header block. If it does not, it needs to return a soap fault um, with the must under or not understood uh, code. So the fault in that case would look like this. So we have seen this one before. So uh, here we have uh, the header not understood. Um, it points using the qualified name to the header block that was not understood, including the namespace, of course. Uh, and uh, then the code is must understand. And uh, the text is that one or more header blocks were not understood. So yeah, we have seen this one uh, before. And this brings us to the third uh, attribute uh, that we'll add to the SOAP uh, header box, and that's the relay attribute. Uh, in this case, it says whether a block is reliable or not reliable, and uh, it plays a role in how the intermediary actually uh, behaves, whether or not it uh, relays that header block or not. And we'll get to that uh, in a little bit. So uh, now when we get back to the processing of header blocks by a SOAP node, uh, the SOAP node determines um, the uh, roles somehow, that's application specific. It identifies the header blocks that target the SOAP node according to the roles assumed and the role attributes on those header blocks. If um, some of those header blocks are mandatory. So they have the must understand attributes set to true. And uh, the node is not able to process those. It generates the SOAP fault and ends the processing of that message. The rest of the message is not relayed anywhere or forwarded along the SOAP message path. Then when everything is OK and it understands all the header blocks, it processes the header blocks. And this is, again, application specific. So uh, yeah, this is done by, uh, by the application logic. 
and it processes the mandatory header, header blocks and it may or may not process the non-mandatory header blocks. And then if the node is an intermediary, it relays uh, the header blocks along the SOAP message path. Uh, now for each block, uh, there is a, basically a set of rules um, saying that uh, when a header block is targeting the SOAP intermediary, which means the role uh, the assumed role of the inter intermediary matches the targeted role of the SOAP header block. Uh, that process block is removed, then uh, ignored, which means non-processed header blocks, which are non-relayable, so they have relay set to false, are also removed, and uh, those that have relay set to true are retained in the message. Uh, and all the header blocks not targeting the intermediary are also retained in the message. If the first two points are everything that the intermediary does, it is called a forwarding SOAP intermediary. If in addition, the intermediary actually uh, adds some header blocks or modifies some or removes some uh, header blocks, it is called an active SOAP intermediary, which means it actively interferes with, uh, with the message. And uh, I have an illustration of the process here. So we have the SOAP sender, and the SOAP sender actually sends a message. We ignore the body, that's for the ultimate receiver, but we focus here on uh, the header and the header blocks. And we have four header blocks here. We have header block A, B, C, and D. A has the role annotate, and uh, again, this is a simplification um, because we know that uh, the roles are URIs, but let's, let's assume that this is a short version of a URI. So it has the annotate role and uh, this header block must be understood. Uh, now header block B has also the role annotate and it has the relay attributes set to true. So it is a relayable block. Then we have uh, header block C with the next role, which means that uh, the next uh, SOAP node receiving this message needs to process that block. Uh, and then we have header block D with the role log, which is an application specific log um, uh, in the same way as the annotate role. Okay, so if this message uh, reaches a forwarding uh, intermediary, um, the forwarding intermediary first needs to assume some roles. So this one will assume the annotate role and it assumes the next role because every SOAP node needs to assume the next role. Um, and uh, therefore, when it comes to header block A, um, this one is, is targeting the intermediary due to the annotate role and it must be understood. So let's say, that this intermediary understands that block and processes, uh, processes it somehow. So uh, this header block, block disappears from the message. Then header block B has also the role annotate. So it uh, targets uh, this intermediary, but it is a relayable uh, block. So it stays in the message uh, in the header. Then header block C has the next role, which needs to be processed by the intermediary. So it disappears from the message. And uh, then uh, there is the header block D, uh, which, uh, which has the log role. It does not target this intermediary, so it stays in, uh, in the message. Um, so yeah, this is a forwarding intermediary. Now, if we generate some more blocks, such as header block E here, uh, the intermediary becomes an active intermediary because it doesn't simply uh, forward some, uh, some header box, it adds some more. So in this case, it adds the header box E and also it uh, reinserts the header box A into the message because that one was previously processed by the forwarding intermediary. And uh, now it is reinserted into, uh, into the message and um, yeah, so this is what an active intermediary does. Well, so those were the rules of uh, processing of SOAP messages. And uh, this then influences our decisions on whether to put some piece of data into a SOAP header or SOAP body. We have already seen uh, in uh, WSDL that uh, we can decide that in the binding part. So where we bind messages to um, the transport protocol such as SOAP uh, 
we basically determine whether a specific message part or a message is uh, included in the SOAP header or SOAP body. Um, we, have, we have used SOAP body for the calculator, but we may have chosen a uh, SOAP header. And uh, this is basically how you can decide whether to use a header or a uh, body for the data. It, uh, it is based, the, the decision is based on uh, whether you want the data to be seen and processed by intermediaries or not. If not, then the data goes into the SOAP body. If yes, then it needs to go uh, into the SOAP headers. And the intermediaries then can provide uh, value-added services based on the headers, such as um, authentication or encryption of the message. So it may be that the sender encrypts the message, sends it to, um, to some uh, service endpoint, and there a SOAP intermediary intercepts that message and decrypts the message based on the information in uh, some uh, SOAP header and uh, passes the message in a decrypted way along the message path uh, to the ultimate receiver, which then doesn't have to uh, implement some uh, decryption logic, for instance. So that's one use case uh, of a SOAP intermediary, but uh, you can imagine many, uh, many more use cases such as uh, implementation of transactions, uh, authentication and so on. So basically those are um, pieces of data that go into the header blocks and are processed in some way, but do not influence the ultimate receiver because the ultimate receiver is for instance, inter interested only in, in the data and not uh, in the way the data is transmitted uh, along the SOAP message path. Um, this brings us back to the uh, message styles uh, or operation styles. Uh, we have seen those before. There are two basic styles, the RPC style and the document style. I introduced it a little bit, but uh, let's take a closer look and we'll start with the RPC style web services. So here basically um, SOAP is used just to implement uh, a remote procedure call, which means that we'll have a code with uh, a method that will be implemented as a remote procedure call using SOAP. But the code basically doesn't know anything about SOAP uh, other than it, that it uses some web services libraries. And it definitely doesn't know anything about XML, for instance, which is used by SOAP. Um, and um, therefore, the, the, date, the, the application data is uh, not natively exchanged as XML. And um, the application doesn't have access to the underlying XML messages uh, relayed using SOAP at all. So it looks something like this, and this will remind you of what we did uh, or what we are going to do maybe in, in the tutorials. So here we have an interface uh, on the uh, right top part uh, of the slide. And here we have uh, the unit converter uh, interface for conversion of uh, degrees Celsius into Fahrenheit, for instance. And here we have the web service and the web method. We are going to implement this on, on the server and we are going to call this from a client. And we say that uh, the SOAP binding style is RPC here. And then we have the client. The client basically uh, has the URL of a whistle file of our unit converter web service and then uh, it has the qualified name, the queue name of the service in that whistle file. And it calls the service create method with those two URLs, uh, or basically with the URL and the qualified name. And um, then on the service, it calls the get port method with the uh, UC unit converter interface. And what it gets is an implementation of that interface using the web service. So uh, in the converter uh, object, we now have the implementation of the UC interface using the web service, and we can call the converter as a regular object. So we call the method converting the degrees here, and we print the result. So that's all the client does. And as you can see, there is basically no indication that uh, SOAP is going to be involved other than some binding and the link to the whistle file. So what this does is that it takes the method parameters, it ser serializes the parameters into a SOAP message according to the whistle file, 
the serialization will look something like this. Uh, there will be the element uh, with the name, the, uh, which is the same as the method name, and the arguments, uh, which are basically named uh, um, according to their order. So here we have just one argument, so that's argument zero. And this is the serialization of, uh, of um, the uh, remote procedure call using SOAP, using XML. But this is, trend, uh, as a, uh, this is a black box to, uh, to the client. The client sees just a method call. So the message is relayed to the server. And there, the server uh, deserializes the message. And basically, it is deserialized into a regular message uh, method call. So this method implemented by the server according to the same interface is called. The, the parameter is passed to the method. Uh, the method does the calculation and returns a uh, value. And this return value, again, uh, as a black box, basically, to both the client and the server, gets uh, serialized into a SOAP response, again, into XML, and sent back to the client. The client library deserializes this, and uh, the method basically returns. And uh, the result is uh, then printed in our case. So this is RPC implemented using SOAP. As you can see, the application has no idea about the XML elements and attributes used. It just uses a remote procedure call. The other style is the document style. Well, basically, the application needs to prepare the XML document to be enveloped in SOAP and sent using SOAP. So here, the application sees that the data is in XML, prepares the XML structure. Uh, it knows about XML. It encodes its data in the XML document. And then it uses SOAP just to transfer this XML document. So that is the case where you have uh, like a normally named XML elements. It is closer to uh, the real world representation of uh, what is in the data. Um, and it is, uh, yeah. Uh, one, one more distinction is that this a document style web service is typically asynchronous. So you send a message, then you do something else, and some, uh, some other time a response uh, arrives where the RPC is typically synchronous because you call the method and you wait until the method returns. Yep, so those are web services uh, styles. And um, this basically brings us to the end of today's lecture. Again, it is a short one because um, as with Whistle, the important part here is that you uh, actually try it out by yourself and we'll do that in the tutorials. So um, this brings us back to the um, motivation for SOAP and one of those motivations was its modularity. So we now know how the individual header box can uh, add individual functionalities because those header box are uh, targeted or uh, they are interpreted by um, each, each header block can be interpreted by a different um, functionality, such as digital signatures, transactions, encryption, and so on. Um, and um, those uh, value added services can be added um, to any SOAP message because you can just add a SOAP header block, which um, does not influence any other header blocks and it does not influence what's in the body. So, like this, um, using a standard way you can add more uh, functionality to existing SOAP uh, message paths and uh, mess, uh, SOAP implementations. The same goes for body. You can also have uh, more body parts, each with its own namespace and each targeting a different functionality. But then again, that's up to the ultimate receiver and its implementation, um, how it is actually done. This is uh, an example of a PayPal API, which has two versions. And the SOPA body contains uh, the data according to both versions. So it can be used with both versions of the PayPal API implementation. Um, so again, this um, is the SOAP uh, modularity advantage. Right, and this really is all for today. So um, are there any, any questions? <laughs>